in my design. Okay. All right. Let's start the last uh, lecture of the afternoon. Let me just remind you before David gets going that we have this public lecture this evening being given by your uh, your lecturer, John McGreevy. It'll be at 7.30, just downstairs from here in a room called G1B20, uh, I think we're in. There's two big rooms, and it's one of them. I'm pretty sure it's, it's 20. So... Um, it's geared towards a more general audience, but TASI students are encouraged and welcome to come. So please feel free to, to come support and or heckle John in his public lecture. Uh, having said that, we are ready for another lecture about CFT observables and the null plane from David simmons Stefan. David. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, so last time um, we uh, constructed these operators, which were our first example of a Reggie trajectory in the free scalar theory. Um, and we talked a little bit about representation theory and argued that um, these operators should be thought of as transforming in a Lorentz, trans uh, Lorentz representation, which is a single row Young diagram of length 3 minus d minus j. So this non-integer length uh, Young diagram. Um, and what I want to talk about uh, first now is a, a context in which these kinds of representations appear that's hopefully much more familiar that will demystify them a little bit and also give us some useful language going forward. Um, and so that is the embedding space. So the embedding space is a way of um, thinking about uh, operators in the CFT um, that makes their conformal transformation properties really simple. Um, so the conformal group, and, and I'm going to start with uh, the Euclidean embedding space. So the embedding space for Euclidean CFT, and then we'll move to Lorenzian signature a little bit later. So the Euclidean conformal group is SO d plus 1, 1. And the embedding space is um, uh, R d plus 1, 1, a space on which this group acts uh, linearly. Um, so, uh, um, so I'm going to describe it with light cone coordinates. So I'm going to write an element of this space as um, capital X plus, capital X minus, X mu, where mu runs from 1 to D. Um, and so this is an element of R D plus 1, 1. Um, and I'll take the norm to be x dot x is minus x plus x minus, so these are light cone coordinates, plus x mu x mu. So um, the idea is that the conformal group acts linearly on the embedding space, and flat space, the usual flat space, on which the conformal group acts in some more complicated nonlinear way, can be stuck inside the embedding space. Um, so uh, flat space, RD, or maybe more precisely, it's conformal compactification, SD. So that's just RD plus the point of infinity, um, is equivalent to the projective null cone in the embedding space. Set of Xs in the embedding space such that um, x is null, so x squared is 0, um, modulo a, um, a redundancy, a kind of gauge redundancy, that says that x is equivalent to um, uh, lambda x. Um, so we can rescale x, um, and uh, we get the same equivalence class. Um, 
So the idea is that uh, this is a d plus two dimensional space. If we impose the null condition, then we get down to a d plus one dimensional space, and then we mod out by this gauge redundancy, and so we effectively have d degrees of freedom again. Um, and this gives a very nice way of understanding the action of the conformal group on this space. Um, and the idea is that uh, we get here by fixing a gauge um, x plus equals one. Okay, so this is a valid way of uh, fixing the rescaling um, gauge redundancy. By the way, I'm going to use the word gauge, but there are no gauge fields here or anything. By gauge redundancy, I just mean we're modding out by something. Um, so we can fix x plus equals 1. And then if we solve the null condition, um, uh, then we find that um, uh, x has to have the following form, 1 little x squared little x mu, where little x mu um, is in Rd. Um, and this is called the Poincaré section. And um, the idea uh, for understanding the conformal group is you can start on the Poincaré section and then act with the conformal transformation. And that does something very simple. It just multiplies this vector by a matrix. Yeah, Xu Heng. Yeah, this is a little x, and this is a big x. Yeah, I'm going to do my best to make my big x is really big, but please, uh, please ask me if I don't manage to do that. Other questions? OK, um, good. So the idea is to start on the Poincaré section. Um, then we act with a conformal transformation. That just acts by some matrix. Um, uh, however, it will, in general, take us off the Poincaré section. So we need to use the rescaling redundancy to get back to the Poincaré section. So overall, what we do is we start with, we start with some point x. Um, and we apply a conformal transformation. So we get gx, where g is an element of the conformal group. And then we have to use the, uh, the gauge redundancy to rescale gx by dividing by gx plus. Um, and this combined map, if you start on the point gray section and end on the point gray section, actually is the nonlinear action of the conformal group on this little x-coordinate. Um, and you can check that explicitly by writing down examples of G as matrices, acting with them and following this through. And you get, in general, a rational function of little x. Um, and that's exactly the one that you'll find in CFT textbooks. Um, OK, so, so this gives a nice way of understanding the action of the conformal group. Um, and it's also useful for describing how operators transform. So um, if you have a primary operator in a CFT, and let's take a primary scalar for simplicity. Um, then under a conformal transformation, um, it has the following transformation rule. So if I hit it with a conformal transformation, I get um, omega of x prime to the delta phi of x prime, where here x prime is the image of x under the conformal transformation, and omega is the rescaling factor. So if I take a, uh, um, a derivative, x prime mu dx nu. Uh, for a conformal transformation, this is equal to a rescaling factor omega times a local rotation r. OK? And this is the, um, so this is the transformation rule for a primary scalar in a CFT. Hopefully you guys have, have seen something like this before, probably uh, um, at this school. But feel free to ask if something's not clear. Um, so one, uh, one nice observation from this formalism uh, that I'll leave as an exercise um, is that uh, this rescaling factor omega is equal to the thing that you divide by here. So it's equal to 1 over g capital X plus where for capital X, we plug in this, the, point, the, the value of capital X on the point gray section. Okay? We're going to use that in just a second. 
So, um, good. So we can take a primary scalar in flat space, it's a function of little x, and lift it to the embedding space in the following way. So we define capital phi of capital X as capital X plus to the minus delta times phi of capital X mu divided by capital X plus. Um, and so by construction, um, this is homogeneous with degree minus delta. And the magical thing is that um, if you hit this thing with a conformal transformation, so to compute this, you just plug in the definition of capital Phi of X, and then you use the conformal transformation property of uh, little Phi, and then you use this fact, um, and you find that now capital X just transforms linearly in the dumbest possible way. So the nice thing about this embedding space lift is that um, uh, now um, the conformal transformation properties of the operator are completely obvious, very simple. And um, this lift isn't really doing anything like physically. It's, it's a mathematical trick. This is just a different way of encoding the same operator. And in fact, you can go back and forth between these two things. The inverse map is that little phi of little x is just equal to capital phi, where we set x equal to the Poincaré section. Okay, so you shouldn't think of the, the uh, you shouldn't necessarily think of lifting the whole QFT to a d plus two dimensional space. We're not doing anything like that. Instead, we're just using this d plus two dimensional space as a mathematical tool to simplify the transformation properties of the operators. OK, so however, um, your, uh, hopefully your, your memory unit is clicking now. You've seen something like this before. We have something that transforms in this simple way under a a transformation. And actually, the Euclidean conformal group is just a Lorentz group in d plus 2 dimensions. And furthermore, um, it's, this thing is homogeneous in its coordinate. So this is actually a single row Young diagram of SOD minus, of SOD plus 1, 1. It's a Young diagram with length minus delta. OK? So these uh, single row Young diagram representations with non-integer uh, length are actually not mysterious at all. You've seen them before. They're just representations that you might find in a conformal field theory for a primary operator. Um, and this gives an interesting interpretation of, of this thing up here. So the idea is that, um, well, maybe I'll go over to another board. Um, so we can think. of z as an embedding coordinate um, for d minus 2 dimensions for the celestial sphere. Right? It's a null vector in r d minus 1, 1, which would be the correct embedding space for, a d, minus, for d minus 2 dimensions. Um, and then this um, ej of z is just a primary operator on the celestial sphere. With dimension minus the length of the Young diagram, because I'm, using, I'm looking here, so minus 3 minus d minus j, which is just j plus d minus 3. Okay, So this thing isn't so mysterious. It's basically, it's an object that transforms like a primary operator on the celestial sphere with a certain scaling dimension. Um, if you like, you could go to a Poincaré section of the celestial sphere. So for example, you could set z 
in light cone coordinates equal to 1 y squared y, where y is in rd minus 2. And then you would get an operator ej of y that really transforms like we expect a primary to transform. So under a Lorentz transformation, this thing would have a transformation rule that looks like this. Okay? You can do that if you want. And these y's are, um, are stereographic coordinates on the celestial sphere. And in fact, when people do celestial holography, they usually work in these coordinates, except they call y, uh, z, and z bar. So you may have actually seen some of these formulas before in that context. Okay, any questions? Okay. Good. So now that we have this technology under our belts, we're going to talk about um, slightly more complicated representations, um, which we're going to need. And uh, I'm going to present some of this in, in uh, complete generality and then restrict to the cases that we actually need a little bit later. So I'm going to um, I'm going to introduce these more complicated representations in the same way we talked about these ones, where the idea is use, uh, to start with finite dimensional representations where we have a tensor and write those tensors in a different way using index-free notation. And then from there, that will be our jumping off point into making the row lengths non-integer and getting more complicated things. Yes? Is there a dumb question? Why is, why is it y squared and not like magnitude of y? Or... Yeah, I mean, this is the magnitude of y squared. No, but like why, why, uh, like if I want my vector to have the same dimensions, and I, if I give y dim like some dimension and I want my vector to have small dimensions, I would expect it to be square root, like the square root of that. Okay. Oh. Um, you're using dimensional analysis on, on this vector and saying yeah, that all the components should be the same? So the, 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 co uh, the components of this vector do not all have to have the same mass dimension. Um, but dimensional analysis will, will work, and it will be guaranteed by conformal symmetry, which will require you to combine the components in a way that where everything actually does, have, does work. So for example, in the norm, you do x plus times x minus plus x squared, and, and so here you would multiply this times this, and that has the same units as that squared. Other questions? OK, good. So let's talk about more complicated tensors. So let's talk about a, a general tensor of SOD. And I'm going to write SOD because for, for now, for the moment, the the real structure of the group isn't really going to matter. Everything's just going to depend on the algebra. Um, uh, it, it will matter a little bit later. So a general tensor of SOD has a Young diagram with a whole bunch of boxes that, that gives the symmetry structure of the tensor. And um, uh, um, we can label the Young diagram by the lengths of the rows. So the length of the first row is m1, which we can sometimes call j. And then the second row has m2 boxes, m3, and so on, um, up to mn, where n is the rank of the group. So n is floor of d over 2. And a tensor in this representation um, has uh, uh, groups of indices corresponding to each row, which are symmetric. So it'll be t mu1 through mu m1. And it will be symmetric in those indices. Then there'll be another group of indices, nu1 through nu m2, corresponding to the second row. It'll be symmetric in those indices, and so on, up to the last row, which coincidentally I called row. Okay, so this is what, what the tensor looks like. Um, and for an irreducible representation, this tensor. Um, uh, should be traceless. So that means that if we contract any pair of indices with the metric, we should get 0. I'll just say that in words. I'm not going to write it out. So it should be traceless. And then furthermore, there's a kind of hidden antisymmetry property of the tensor that has to do with antisymmetry of the columns in the Young diagram. And the way that works um, is that if you try to, try to over-symmetrize, so for example, if I try to symmetrize the mu indices with together with one of the new indices, okay, then the result is zero. 
So these are the, the properties that a tensor in an irreducible representation with this Young diagram uh, will have. Any questions? OK, so in index-free notation, the idea is to um, introduce uh, a polarization vector for each row of the Young diagram. So we have the z1, z2, up through zn. Um, and then we form a polynomial, t of z1 through zn, by contracting our tensor um, with the corresponding polarization vectors. So this is z1, z1 mu1 through z1 mu m1. We use the z2 for the second, for the group of indices for the second row, z3 for the third row, and so on. And then we would use zn, so zn1, uh, sorry, zn row 1 through zn row mn um, for the last group of indices. So we get this polynomial. Um, and it's a homogeneous polynomial. And so, by the way, I should say that so these z's, um, the zi's are complex in general, uh, sorry, d dimensional complex vectors in general. We'll talk about their reality properties a little bit later, because that will depend on the real form of the group that we're interested in. Um, and um, uh, so, uh, tracelessness means that we can restrict these zi's to be null and mutually orthogonal. So again, the idea is the same as last time. If someone hands you a polynomial and you want to get back the underlying tensor, well, you have to strip off the z's. When you do that, because of these conditions, you'll get a result that is ambiguous up to terms proportional to the metric. But all the terms proportional to the metric are fixed by tracelessness. So you can still reconstruct the tensor. Um, sorry, these have to be, these are all zero. Um, so we have a homogeneous polynomial in a bunch of null vectors, mutually orthogonal null vectors. And then the last non-trivial thing is that um, uh, this is this oversymmetrization condition here. Um, and what it means is that there's a kind of gauge redundancy on the z's. So if I take z2, I can shift um, z2 by something proportional to z1. So I'll write that schematically as some number sign times z1. Um, and what this corresponds to is exactly this oversymmetrization that I wrote here. Um, and the result should vanish. Um, similarly, we can take z3 and shift it by anything proportional to z2 or z1 and so on, up to zn, which can be shifted by anything proportional to any of the other z's. So there's this big um, gauge redundancy um, acting on the z's that this polynomial has to be invariant under. So the idea is that um, a tensor in this representation is equivalent to a homogeneous gauge invariant polynomial of these vectors satisfying this condition. Um, so this, this, might look, this might look a little complicated. There's a nice mathematical result underlying all of this, which is called the borel vey theorem. Um, and uh, what it says is that um, the finite dimensional irreps of a sufficiently nice group G can be realized as, um, I'll write the words because they're a little scary sounding, homomorphic sections of line bundles. Don't worry, we're not going to need this. Um, on the flag manifold. 
of G. So I'm just mentioning this because it's nice to have a little bit of context for this complicated looking result. So the idea is that the, the, the flag manifold of the orthogonal group it has these z's as coordinates. The flag manifold is basically, um, it's uh, the set of z's satisfying these conditions, modulo these gauge redundancies, and also modulo rescaling of the z's. So these z's are like projective coordinates on the flag manifold for the orthogonal group. And this, these scary words, holomor holomorphic sections of line bundles, what they mean in this context is homogeneous polynomials in the z's. Okay? So this means that mathematicians have signed off on this craziness, and so you don't have to worry. OK, so um, good. So now we're ready to talk about spinning operators in CFT. So in the embedding space, um, a non-scalar operator corresponds to a Young diagram of the conformal group with more rows. Um, and uh, we're going to do the explicit example of a traceless symmetric tensor operator. So we discussed a scalar operator before. Now we're just we're going to generalize to a traceless symmetric tensor operator um, with spin j, um, and the claim is that this um, is described by a Young diagram, where the first row has length minus delta and the second row has length j. Okay, so let's see how that works. So the idea is um, we start with. We start by writing the operator in index-free notation. So we introduce a null polarization vector z for this index, for the mu index. And that's just index-free notation for the Lorenz group. Um, and now we're going to lift this thing to an embedding space operator. So lift to the embedding space. Um, and the lift is defined as follows. So we have O of X, capital X, comma, capital Z is defined as X plus, capital X plus to the minus delta. O of little x is equal to capital X mu over X plus, And little z is equal to capital Z mu minus Z plus X mu over X plus. So this is the analog for spinning operators of that and um, of that formula at the top of the board there. And once again, I should emphasize that there's, there's no lifting of the theory. This is just a mathematical trick for rewriting the same operator in a different way. And this rewriting has an inverse. So O of little x, little z, is just the same as O uh, of big X and big Z restricted to the Poincaré section. So the Poincaré section for uh, big X is this. And the appropriate Poincaré section for big Z is this. Okay, And these two operations are inverses of each other. So why, why did I define this? This looks a little complicated, particularly this part. And the key thing is that. Um, O of capital X comma capital Z is, first of all, homogeneous. It's homogeneous in X of degree minus delta and homogeneous in capital Z of degree J. Okay, And that's good. That's what we need for this. And this funny combination here is to, um, is to implement this gauge invariance. Right? So the idea is that capital X is going to be our polarization vector for the first row. Capital Z is our polarization vector for the second row. And so there's a gauge redundancy that Z should be equivalent to shifting by capital X. Okay? And this is the only thing we can write down consistent with Lorentz invariance and um, homogeneity and that gauge redundancy. So um, 
Good. So from this operator, we've managed to define a homogeneous function of null vectors um, satisfying uh, the appropriate gauge redundancy conditions. And furthermore, yeah, they're null. So x squared and z squared are 0. And also x dot z is 0. The last thing to check is how this monstrosity transforms under conformal transformations. So for that, what you do is you start from the formula for how this thing transforms under conformal transformations, which is a textbook formula. Um, maybe I'll switch ports. So um, a spinning operator, if you hit it with a conformal transformation, it's nice to write it in index-free notation. It transforms with this same omega factor. Um, and then um, its polarization vector gets hit with this rotation. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, I just replaced the definition, erased the definition of these uh, r and omega. Um, so this is the formula that you'll find in a CFT textbook. And then the non-trivial thing to do is to use this formula, um, plug in the definition of O of capital X and capital Z, and prove that um, the embedding space lift transforms in the very simple way that you might hope for. So its coordinates just transform linearly. By the way, I apologize for using the same letter for the embedding space lift and the original operator. Hopefully, it doesn't cause too much confusion, but please raise your hand and ask if something is confusing. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so the 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 it's a primary. Oh, sorry. The question was, um, we can think of E J as a primary under a lower dimensional conformal group, and the question is, can we think of that lower dimensional conformal group as the little group of the operator? Um, and uh, so first of all, that lower dimensional conformal group is the Lorenz group, and we're using here the fact that the Lorenz group is the conformal group on the celestial sphere, which is probably something you guys have heard. Um, I wouldn't call it the little group because it can move the operator. So it doesn't fix the operator. Um, there are uh, elements of the group that do fix the operator. For example, if you do a boost in the direction, uh, you can do a boost that fixes this z direction. Um, and what that does is um, that boost rescales, just rescales. Um, so the boost resales doesn't change its direction. Homogeneity, that means that E sub J will pick up some factor. And on this, uh, in terms of the conformal group on the celestial sphere, that boost becomes a dilatation, and the factor that it picks up is the rescaling factor under a dilatation that fixes the point where the operator is. I don't know if that helps. OK, other questions? OK, the question is, why are capital X and capital Z on equal footing? Why do they both transform in the same way under a conformal transformation? So um, uh, that, is, that is how these representations behave. Maybe it's helpful to go back to tensors. So if you have a tensor and you ask, how does it transform under an orthogonal transformation? Well, the answer is that you hit each index with the same rotation matrix. right? Now, what does that mean in terms of the polynomial that you build? Well, if you hit each index with the same rotation matrix, that's the same as hitting each of the polarization vectors with the same rotation matrix. So 
um, that means that the polynomial transforms by having the same rotation matrix act on each of its arguments. And so that's, that's exactly what, we're, what we have over here. Other questions? OK, good. So um, this is an example of a more general phenomenon. If you have an operator, um, some, some, some tensor operator space, that uh, it has some, some index A for a representation of the, um, of the rotation group. And if it, um, if it has a Lorentz representation lambda, where lambda is some equal to some Young diagram, then the Lorentz representation, th then it, um, then as a conformal representation, um, it has a Young diagram of the conformal group given by stacking a row minus delta on top of this uh, lambda. Okay, and so we saw that example for a spin J operator. Um, that's a, a spin J operator is a single row Young diagram of the Lorenz group. That's down here. We stack on top of it another row of length minus delta. This gives us a Young diagram of the conformal group. Yeah. But it's, it's, well, minus delta might not be an integer, so it's not clear whether it's really longer than. Good. Good. So, you, you, right. So, it, the question is does it matter? It seems like it matters where we insert the row. And, and how are we supposed to think about that? So, that's absolutely right. So, in a Young diagram for finite dimensional representations, you have the requirement that the rows have to be decreasing length. And when you talk about these funnier representations, you should think of a non integer length as being infinite. So as soon as it becomes non-integer, now it's infinite length. Um, and that means you can have it on top. Um, and you can't really compare two infinite length things, as we'll see, because we're going to write down a transformation that actually swaps different infinite length rows. Um, uh, but you can compare them to the finite length rows. And all the finite length ones have to go underneath. Good. No, I haven't said anything about unitarity here. That's right. Um, that's right. Good. So, all right. But let me say a little bit about these funny non-integer length uh, rows. Like, what, what is what is going on? So, one way to think about these um, the lengths of the rows. So, row lengths. Um, are eigenvalues of a highest weight state um, under Carton generators. Let me explain this a little bit. So first of all, Carton generators are a set of um, mutually commuting generators of the Lie algebra of a group. And for the conformal group, for the Euclidean conformal group, we can take the Carton generators um, We can take the Cartan generators to be minus d, where d is the dilatation operator. The minus sign doesn't really matter here, but it's useful. It's a useful convention, and so so we have the dilatation operator, and then we can take rotations around various axes. So the rotation between the one axis, the rotation between the three four axis, and so on, 
all the mutually commuting rotations that we can write down. Okay? And these are the Cartan generators of the conformal group. Of course, dilatations commute with each of these, and each of these commutes with each other. So this is a, a Cartan subalgebra. And then the idea is that this highest weight state, to get the highest weight state, what you do is you choose um, each polarization vector um, to be an eigenvector. Whoa, eigenvector of a corresponding Cartan generator. This is, a, this is a very fancy sounding. Let me give an example. So we have, oh, let's take the Cartan generator D. So we can associate these Cartan generators with rows of the Young diagram. And we can think about this one, minus D, as being associated with the first row. So let's take the polarization vector for the first row, which is capital X, and let's set it to an eigenvector of D. So um, what, is, what is that eigenvector well, with eigenvalue 1? So I'm not going to write out what D is in the embedding space. Um, you can look it up. I'll just tell you what the eigenvector is. So this is the eigenvector with eigenvalue 1. And physically, this corresponds to the origin in the Poincaré section. Um, so little x is 0 here. Um, so what I mean by this statement is set capital X equal to this. Physically, take the operator and stick it at the origin. Okay. Then what about z1? That's the polarization vector for the next row. And it has a corresponding Cartan generator, m12. So we should set that equal to an eigenvector of m12. What is that? Well, it's 0, 0, little z1, where little z1 is equal to 1, comma, i, comma, dot, 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 0. Okay? What is this? It's the eigenvector of a rotation in the 1, 2 plane with eigenvalue 1. Okay? So this is what capital X should be. This is what capital Z should, Z1 should be, and so on. You can go on and find out what all the capital Zs need to be. They're the eigenvectors of each of these generators. The nice thing about doing this is when you do this, the homogeneity of the operator in the polarization vector becomes the eigenvalue of the operator under the Cartan generator. Right? If you act with the Cartan generator, it just acts on the vector. The vector is an eigenvector of the Cartan generator, so it gets some coefficient. And O is homogeneous in the vector, so you pull out that coefficient raised to a certain power. Okay? That's how it works. So by setting the polarization vectors in this way, you construct what I'll call a highest weight state of the representation. And so now we can see a little bit about what the rules are for these funny non-integer length rows. The point is that um, these generators, the rotation generators, they generate a compact subgroup of the Euclidean conformal group, right? They're rotations. And therefore, their corresponding row lengths have to be integers. They have to be quantized. I guess if you have Fermi-Knight representations, they can be half integers. Um, but uh, we're just talking about bosonic representations. They have to be integers. Meanwhile, D, this is a non-compact Cartan generator. It generates a non-compact subalgebra of the or subgroup of the conformal group. Um, and therefore, its eigenvalue doesn't have to be an integer. It can be whatever we want. Okay? And so, so that's the rule. So, so the rule is that um, uh, each non-compact Cartan generator um, can have a non-integral row length. Questions? Yeah. Can we do the, uh, the, the 
Yeah, so that, the question was, can we understand spinners by allowing half integer numbers of boxes? Um, and uh, the, the, the answer is yes, you can write down Young diagrams with half integer numbers of boxes and those have all the, all the right properties. Um, in terms of like uh, what, what things look like in, in index free notation, um, you need to use, use uh, slightly different notation to get this, the spinners. But the idea is that spinner representations correspond to holomorphic sections of a different kind of line bundle. So you need a basis of those sections to work with. And um, these, these polynomials and the x's and the z's don't give you that basis, so you need to introduce new, new basis elements. Um, and uh, so your operator becomes functions of some extra variables that satisfy various constraints, and, um, but you can, you can still do everything. Other questions? Yeah. Sorry, the, can you? Why should they be non-compact? Okay, so whether the generators are non-compact or not is a question about the the um, the structure of the group. Um, so in the Euclidean conformal group, these generators they generate rotations, and rotation groups are compact. So that's what I mean by these being compact generators. This generates a dilatation. And the dilatation group is just R, like the, the real, real numbers, and it's non-compact. Um, good. So, okay. So now we're finally ready to move to Lorenzian signature. So the Lorenzian conformal group um, is SO D comma 2. And it's actually the universal cover of SOD comma 2. So that's what this twiddle means, universal cover. That's actually not, not going to be very important for us. Um, uh, what are the generators, uh, Cartan generators of this group? Well, there, it has dilatations as well. It has, uh, and then it has Lorentz generators. One of those Lorentz generators is a boost. And the rest of them are rotations. So these are rotations. This is a boost. And this is a dilatation. So this group has two non-compact generators, the dilatation and the boost. And therefore, you can make two uh, of the row lengths non-integers and still get a sensible representation of the Lorenzian conformal group. Yes? So in this Euclidean signature, you need to rely very much on the non-integers in the But because of the Lorenzian, you have the question is, can you make sense of light ray operators in Euclidean signature? And the answer is no, you can't. Um, because the light ray operator representations are not sensible representations of the Euclidean conformal group. That's a, a quick way to say it. You can't. They're intrinsically Lorentzian objects. Um, they transform nicely under the Lorentzian conformal group. But uh, if you try to exponentiate the action of the Euclidean conformal group on these objects, you won't be able to do it. You can act with the algebra. Uh, those, are, those are just differential operators. Those are fine, but you cannot exponentiate them. OK, so the Lorenzian group has these two non-compact generators. And that means that it's possible to consider um, representations of the Lorenzian conformal group with this structure. where delta and j are non-integer. In other words, you can have non-integer spin operators in Lorentzian signature. And detectors are examples. Questions? Um, yeah, so the, the gauge redundancies uh, are, the, are the same for, the, for, for this. Um, the only, so the significance of the non-integer row length is that you allow the operator to have non-integer homogeneity and 
therefore, it doesn't have to be a polynomial in the corresponding uh, polarization vectors. So it's not a polynomial in x or z1, but it would be a polynomial in the remaining ones. But that's it. You don't change the gauge redundancies or anything. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you'll see. You'll see. So to exchange the order of the two rows is what I'm going to talk about next. You'll see how it works. Okay, so here you fix the order. Yeah. Minus yeah. Minus delta goes on top. That's right. Okay. Yeah. You'll see what I mean by changing the order. The ordering. You, you don't just. You don't just wave a magic wand. You have to do something. Um, okay. Yes. Good, but they don't mutually commute with each other. So the idea is that the each row has a Cartan generator, which are mutually commuting generators. Um, so the question was, there are boosts along all the different d minus 1 directions. Um, but there's only one non-compact Cartan generator. Of course, you can pick different Cartan subalgebras. So I pick, could have picked, instead of m01, I could have picked m03 here. And then I would have had to change these, because I would have to choose rotations that commute with that m03. Um, but all Cartan subalgebras are equivalent. Yeah. Did you start talking about non-integral Helicov and Jules? Because the, the integral was like the vector that you define in the beginning. Does that, is there any problem with it uh, being very defined here? Is, so the question is, is there a problem with the detector being well defined when you start talking about non-integer deltas and j's and stuff like that? And um, the answer is no. So we're going to write down explicit examples um, with various non-integer deltas and j's. And in fact, the E sub j's for general complex j that I wrote down before are examples. You can compute their scaling dimension. The scaling dimension is j minus 1. So when j is complex, it's you know whatever you want. And you can compute their spin as we did before. And the spin is um, 3, uh, 3 minus d minus j. And that's also non-integer. So those are examples of these things. Yes? So one way is that local operators have to make sense in Euclidean signature. So maybe, maybe I'll just say some, some vague words. So um, in, in, in QFT, we have, um, we have symmetries. And we can use representation theory to um, help describe things. Um, but representation theory isn't everything. So the representation theory of the Euclidean conformal group is different from the representation theory of the Lorentzian conformal group. We can use one in Euclidean signature and one in Lorentzian signature. And then there's this sort of secret sauce of analyticity. Um, correlators in quantum field theory satisfy analyticity properties that actually connect Euclidean and Lorentzian signature to each other. And these analyticity properties don't have a simple representation theoretic summary. So in QFT, you use representation theory when, when you can, but it doesn't tell the whole story. Um, the, um, it's this analyticity that, that, that connects them. So the, 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 constraint, the full constraints are somehow a combination of the Euclidean conformal group and the Lorentzian conformal group and whatever else you can reach by analytically continuing. OK. All right. So. We've introduced a bunch of technology. We're now ready to talk about something called the light transform, which gives a really simple way to think about the conformal transformation properties of these detectors, in particular, some of the detectors that I wrote down uh, yesterday. So the light transform is, is this thing um, that switches the rows of the Young diagram. And I'll explain how it works. It's an integral transform. Um, so you start with an operator um, capital O, which for simplicity I'll assume is described by a two-row Young diagram. Uh, so it has dimension delta um, and spin j. Um, and the light transform is uh, an integral of the operator along a null direction. And it's nicest to write it in the embedding space. And it looks like this. So um, in order to write this down, um, uh, so um, first of all, this 
uh, integral transform is manifestly conformal invariant, conformally invariant. Um, and the reason is because under conformal transformation, um, the arguments of O just transform by the matrix uh, corresponding to that conformal group element, right? Um, so uh, that means that X and Z just transform linearly under conformal transformations in this formula. Okay, so this is clearly conformally invariant. But another thing we can check, we should check to make sure that this makes sense is, is um, this gauge redundancy. Um, so we want to check that it's gauge invariant under shifting z to z plus um, some number times x. Um, and indeed, it is, um, but in a slightly non-trivial way. Um, the, what happens is if you shift z by lambda x, then you have to redefine alpha in the integral by shifting alpha um, appropriately. And then you get back to the same thing. So this is actually, this, this combination is actually gauge invariant. Yes? Here, yeah, lambda can be, lambda can be, let's say lambda is real here, but it has to be true for any real number. Yeah, good question. I think I understand your question now. Yeah, let's, let's say lambda has to be real. Um, other questions? Yeah. Good. The question is, does the integral converge? Um, and um, the, the answer is yes. Um, and uh, um, uh, mm, let's see. Um, the answer is yes. And one way you can check it is by doing this integral inside correlators. Um, and uh, it suffices to check it in a two-point function. Um, and um, uh, actually, no, I don't think it does suffice to check it in a two-point function. You, you can check it in a three-point function. That definitely suffices. And, and you can compute it um, explicitly and see that it converges. We'll also see another way to see that it converges in a second. Other questions? OK, so this funny integral transform does a funny thing to the quantum numbers of O. So you can compute the homogeneity of L of O in both capital X and capital Z. Um, you just plug this into this formula. You do a little bit of rearranging. I'll leave this as an exercise. And what you find is that it has homogeneity um, J minus 1 in capital X and 1 minus delta in capital Z. So what this means is that the light transform changes the quantum numbers in the following way. So if you have an operator with dimension delta and spin j, it becomes an operator with dimension delta L and spin JL, where Delta L is 1 minus J, and JL is 1 minus delta. So in particular, it does this job of, of, of flipping the first two rows of the Young diagram. Um, and you see it does this without modifying the gauge invariance condition. So this thing is still gauge invariant in the same way that O was gauge invariant. Um, so there's an immediate check that you can do that this all makes sense, which is to check that this transformation of quantum numbers preserves the Casimirs of the conformal group. So for example, there's the quadratic Casimir of the conformal group, which uh, looks like this, delta times delta minus d plus j times j plus d minus 2. And this transformation is actually a symmetry of this Casimir. I encourage you to check it. So the question is, are the two representations isomorphic to each other? Um, and um, uh, the, the answer is, um, uh, is no, except at special deltas and j's. Um, so um, the case in which the, this thing is an isomorphism 
um, is when deltas and j's are on the Lorenzian principal series. So delta is a specific complex value. Delta has to be on a particular complex line, and j has to be on a particular complex line. When that happens, L is actually invertible. It squares to, it squares to 1. Um, but, um, uh, but in general, it's not invertible. I'm leaving out a little bit of subtleties that you can ask me after, afterwards. Ah, OK, great. Uh, 15 minutes. OK. Um, good. So All right, so this embedding space formula is a little bit abstract. It's helpful to look at um, the light transform in, in the Poincaré section. So that just means that we restrict capital X and capital Z to their Poincaré section values. Um, and then uh, what you find is that the light transform of little x and little uh, a light transform of O at little x and little z, which is just what happens when you plug these into that formula, uh, becomes the following: it's an integral from minus infinity to infinity, d alpha minus alpha to the minus delta minus j, ho of x minus z over alpha z. Okay, so this is a little bit more helpful in terms of seeing what this is actually doing. So what's going on with the integration contour? Well, the idea is that the integral starts when alpha is minus infinity, and that's when O is sitting at the point x. So this is an integral that starts at x, um, and then it moves in the z direction. So it moves along, um, along a null direction. Okay, so the integral goes along. Um, happily. And then finally, it gets to alpha equals 0. And at alpha equals 0, this point goes off to future null infinity. So we get to future null infinity. Um, but future null infinity in a conformal field theory is not actually a special place. Um, and what you should do is imagine continuing the integral off into um, beyond, beyond Minkowski space. Let me be a little bit more concrete about that. So a conformal field theory um, can actually be defined on the Lorenzian cylinder, um, which um, uh, um, is tiled by Minkowski patches. So the usual Minkowski space would look like this. This is a cylinder, so these two lines should be identified with each other. And then the next Minkowski patch looks like this. It's here, it wraps around, and then the other half is over here. So this is what it looks like in two dimensions, in two DCFTs. And this, it's qualitatively the same in d dimensions. Um, the idea is that CFT correlators actually don't have any singularities at these locations. There's nothing special about them. And so you can integrate operators by starting at some point x in one uh, Minkowski patch and moving into the next Minkowski patch. And that's what the light transform does. It starts at x and it ends at the x in the next patch. Um, by the way, this formula is a nice way to, to answer John's question about whether this thing is finite. So you can see that this integral, the, to check whether it's finite, you need to check how it behaves near the endpoints. And here you can see that at the endpoints, you have this suppression factor. And as long as delta, delta plus j is sufficiently large, the integral converges. Because this point is just moving somewhere. The correlator is going to be finite there unless there happens to be another operator at that point. And so the integral converges as long as delta plus j is bigger than 1. So, yes? Isn't that a formula not a cyclic data? 
is there a problem in alpha equals zero? No. So it looks like there is, but there actually isn't. So this, this thing that looks like it has a branch cut at alpha equals zero will actually go away inside a CFT correlator. It's guaranteed. And the embedding space formula, formula is the way to see it. In the embedding space formula, there's nothing interesting about alpha equals zero. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so in the embedding space, you can see how the rows are swapping the places because the z is in the place of the x and the x is in the place of the z. Mm -hmm. But it's not the case in the operator. Yeah, that's right. So I encourage you to, to, to do the exercise of making this restriction and doing a little bit of reshuffling to get to this formula. It's, it's, it's worth it. But yeah, so Rajiv is noticing that here x has been restored in its rightful place in the first argument. Um, and z is in the second argument. But that's not how things look in the uh, embedding space formula that I wrote up there. It's worth playing around with it just to see how it works. Other questions? OK. Um, so the case that we care about is where, um, so OK. The light transform of an operator is a null integral of the operator. The case that we care about is where that integral lies along future null infinity. That's the, that's the case that's relevant for the story about detectors. So what that means is we want to take this point x and we want to send it over here so that the contour starts here at spatial infinity and moves along future null infinity and ends up at future infinity. OK? So what we care about, so we want um, uh, the light transform of O where we set x equal to spatial infinity and z equal to whatever we want. Um, and uh, so in fact, um, I claim that the operators we were talking about before, the integrals of local operators that were creating detectors, are exactly light transforms of this, of this type. So for example, the energy flux operator, E2 of z, is 2 times the light transform of the stress tensor evaluated at infinity comma z. Um, and um, this calculation is done in the notes in great detail. I'm actually going to skip it here um, in the interest of time, although maybe I'm even just running out of time. Um, uh, but I encourage you to look at the notes and see how it works. Am I out of time? You have eight minutes. Oh, I do have eight minutes. OK, great. Um, good. So um, I'll leave this uh, as, an, as an exercise. Uh, if you're ambitious, um, or you can just read the notes to see how it works. Questions? Yeah. What does physically happen when we take So the question is, what is physically happen happening when we take the light transform of a quantity? And you should think of it as a null integral that's organized in a way that makes the conformal transformation properties easy to think about. That's it. Other questions? Yeah. So for complex G, can I think of the light transform as a integral of, null integral over some local operator? So the question is, for complex J, can I think of the light transform as the null integral of a local operator? And the answer is no. So um, the idea of these Reggie trajectories is that they're families of um, families of operators, families of detectors that are that are analytic in spin. When the spin becomes an integer, then the operator becomes the light transform of something. But when the spin is not an integer, it's not. More questions? Right. Why is it called a Reggie trajectory? So um, uh, um, uh, the 
cleanest connection between them is via ADS-CFT. Um, so uh, we'll actually see an example of that a little bit later. Um, the uh, registry trajectories of operators in terms of delta and j, you can translate those into masses and spins of particles in the bulk in ADS-CFT. And then the, these curves literally become the curves that you would find in string theory, uh, in theories that are dual to string theory. That's one reason for it. Another reason for it is that these uh, families of operators are very important in describing the Reggie limit. Um, and um, uh, in scattering amplitudes, the um, Reggie limit is described by analytically continuing the M and J plane and talking about these analytically continued particles. Um, in CFT, the Reggie limit is described by analytically continuing in spin and talking about these families of operators. So that's another reason that they, you might call them Reggie trajectories. More questions? OK. Um, good. So, so what have we gained from all of this? We introduced a lot of technology. Um, so let's try to reap some benefits from it. Um, so one, one thing is symmetries. Um, it's a lot easier to think about symmetries now. Um, and so we can revisit the, uh, um, the calculation of the spin of these detectors uh, in the free theory. Um, at least in the case where there are light transforms of something. So let's, let's consider the light transform um, of OJ, where J is this um, spin J uh, higher spin current in the free theory. Um, and let's stick it at infinity with some Z. Um, so it, this, is, this is equal to E sub j if j is an even integer, if j equals 2, 4, dot, dot, dot. OK? So uh, sorry, I guess it could start at 0. Um, so let's compute its quantum numbers in this case. So the idea is that um, so the operator um, OJ has dimension and spin, which are just j plus d minus 2 and j. And so its light transform um, has um, uh, quantum numbers delta L, which is 1 minus j, and JL, which is 1 minus j plus d minus 2, which is 3 minus d minus j. Um, and this is exactly the thing that we found before. Um, so we've recovered the, the spin of these uh, detectors in a simple way. And this is minus the mass dimension. It's minus because you should think of this as an operator at infinity. And as I mentioned before, the mass dimension of a primary operator at infinity is minus its delta. OK, so in the case, uh, in, in the even integer spin case, this gives a very simple way to understand the things that we observed before um, uh, using this technology. Okay, and I think um, the last thing that I'll do is prove a quick lemma about the operators that also uses symmetry. Um, so the claim is um, an operator. 
O with non-integer spin. And sometimes I'll use this like funny boldface O to indicate that it has non-integer spin. It doesn't matter whether this is the light transform of something or not. It's just any non-integer spin operator um, must kill the vacuum. Whoops. Okay, so um, here's a proof. This proof is maybe a little bit too slick, but um, uh, let, let's see it anyway. So the idea is, let's consider the operator in the detector frame. So we're going to consider O of infinity comma Z. And what that means is uh, it's O where I set capital X equal to the embedding space coordinate for infinity, which is 0, 1, 0. And I set capital Z equal to 0, 0 little z is uh, a, a polarization vector for the point at infinity. OK, so that's, this is just a definition. Let's consider this operator. Um, it uh, transforms like a primary at infinity. So that means it's killed by the momentum generators. In other words, it's a translationally invariant operator. And so that means that if we act with this operator um, on the vacuum, uh, we get a translationally invariant state. In other words, it has zero momentum. On the other hand, um, uh, if this operator has non-trivial um, spin, then this state should transform in a non-trivial Lorentz representation. However, the only zero momentum state in a CFT is the CFT vacuum, and that transforms trivially under the Lorentz group. And therefore, this state has to vanish. So that's a very general argument. Um, there's a more concrete thing that you can do, which is to study the case of a light transform of a local operator. So that's a less general case. Um, because I, I claim that not all operators are of that form. But if you do study that, it's, there's a nice calculation to do where you take L, you act on the vacuum. Um, and to figure out whether this state is zero or not, you want to see this in the function. So you can stick any insertions you want in here, and then you have L of O acting on the vacuum. This is uh, an integral of a conformal correlator. And um, there's a simple argument that this integral vanishes. There's a nice contour argument. Um, and uh, if you want to see the argument, you can look in my Tazi lectures from 2019, um, uh, which, are, which are also online, um, that go through that argument. So th that simple contour argument tells you that L of O has to kill the vacuum. And then it, it makes sense. Um, it's sensible that a Regi trajectory, which is something that's supposed to analytically continue between different L of O's, had better also kill the vacuum. Um, right? It's analytically continuing between operators that all kill the vacuum. So it makes sense that it kills the vacuum. And this is the, the representation theoretic argument for why it has to. OK. Um, I think I'll stop there um, and take questions, more questions. The question is, do all light ray operators come from the analytic continuation of the light transform of a local operator? Uh, and I, I don't know the answer. Um, I think that um, um, uh, yeah, I think the one, one good thing to think about is to, to try to get creative and see what you can construct in perturbation theory by attaching other kinds of objects to the light, the light ray operator. I mean, I guess you could, um, I don't know. Uh, as you asked last time, if you could construct something that was charged under some higher form symmetry, then that would be a proof that uh, it is not the analytic continuation of light transforms of local operators. But I don't know if you can. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it would be interesting to think about 
uh, if there's something creative you can do to create a sort of new symmetry sector of light ray operators that are not of this class. But I don't know. Yeah. Good. So the question is, does conformal invariance constrain the correlation functions of these operators? And um, yes. So th this technology is particularly nice for making that manifest. So one, one really nice calculation um, is to study um, a three-point function, O1, um, O1 of x1, light transform of O2 of x2, comma, z2, um, O3 of x3. So concretely, this is where you take a conformal three-point function of O1, O2, and O3, and you do a crazy integral of it. Um, and the cool thing that happens is it comes out uh, to be the following. Um, so let me see if I can uh, if I can get it get it correct. Let's see. So it's it's z2 dot um, x21 times x23 squared minus z2 dot x23 x13 squared um, to the um, uh, one minus delta delta 2 divided by various um, xijs to various powers. Um, this is the numerator of a three-point function of two scalars and an operator with spin, where the spin is that. So it, this is just the textbook formula for a conformal three-point function. Um, and the only thing that happens is that uh, the quantum numbers just get shuffled around into different places. And there's also a coefficient out front that's a function of uh, the deltas um, and j, which you can compute, some gamma functions. So that's a really cool, really cool exercise. And the idea is that the light transform packages together the null integrated operator in a way that's just as useful as the original operator. Um, yeah. Other questions? Well, in view of the time, I think we should cut it off here let you ask uh, David more questions afterwards. Let me just remind you, so I know I already reminded you about the public lecture tonight, 7.30. Tomorrow, again, we have no 9 o'clock lecture, so we'll start at 10.45. And also tomorrow evening at 6 will be our banquet at Kerning Alumni Center. So just have that in your head for tomorrow. Let's thank David again.